everybody, welcome back. God bless each and every one of you. I am so excited to be here with all of you that we have this opportunity to just come together. And the Lord has laid uh, some messages on my heart and um, you know, nothing works out when I'm not moving in the spirit that he would have me go. And I have to often just sit back and say, Lord, is this what is this what you want me to convey? And sometimes he tells me no because that's of you. So um, I'm, I want to bring meaningful messages here that lift up power and the awesomeness of our Lord and Savior. And though he would have us know the truth, we've got to keep our eyes on him. He's not going to make us ignorant of the devices of the enemy. He won't. So we have to keep our eyes on him, stay focused, because Guys, we have to be sealed up in the Lord right now. I think everybody knows something is happening. Even those that do not believe in Jesus Christ, they are getting an alarm in their spirit. Okay? And, um, you know, guys, uh, God's on the throne, and he has a plan. He has a plan, and he is doing something. And we have to trust in him. We have to trust that our times are in his hands, and that he's true, and he's faithful. So, that said, before I dig into where I want to go in the scriptures, I wanted to talk to you about Mount Cinnabon. Did you, did you all see that? It erupted Monday. Did you guys see that cloud? That is the most bizarre. I mean, it, it's really strange. I'm not going to sit here and depict it apart for you. You can look at it yourself. I think it speaks volumes. There's something really significant in it. That's what I know. <laughs> and um, I mean, they had a video of it erupting and those poor children screaming, screaming for their mamas. You know, this is in Indonesia, guys. They, they've been hit a lot. And, um, you know, guys, let's not forget our brothers and sisters that are overseas, okay? Because many of them, especially in the Middle East, I'm telling you, they got some faith. They got some faith. Those people uh, keep coming to church in the Middle East, even though they know they could die for going there. That's some faith. Boy, we are so spoiled over here. We really are. But there's going to come a trying upon the whole entire world. So, what I really found interesting about Mount Cinnabon was just the name in itself. <laughs> Especially, I, I didn't, wouldn't have even thought about it if I hadn't looked at the picture here. It does look like a big old skull. and looks like something so demonic is coming out of the back of it where the brain would be. I don't know, but when you look at the word sin a bung, do you know what a bung is? It is a, a cork. They're used in wine vessels. And it keeps the wine from pouring out. The cork. And I really can see 
the depths of Christ in that, in, a, in our as we are the vessels. And it was exactly what he was doing in the very first miracle when he turned the water into wine in the vessels. He took six vessels. And he talks about the old wine skins. You can't put new wine in old wine skins. He's talking about the old covenant versus the new. And that miracle he did at the wedding, that was all about what he's doing. He's doing something in his people and those that have faith and believe on him. And of course, there is another meaning for bung, <laughs> it's a slang. And uh, I think we all know what that is. And uh, it's got everything to do with dung. And uh, I don't know. And sin is dung. Okay. It is. It sure is. And, he, and Jesus talks about cleansing the inside. You can look all so holy. You can be doing all these things. You can be looking oh so righteous in the flesh and you you know and somebody can be filthy on the inside if you've not had your heart cleansed by christ and that's how he cleanses the fish is he takes our hardened hearts we surrender them over to him we, we, we rip them out and we take his heart which turns it into a vessel of his representation of his love his mercy his grace his forgiveness of what he did on the cross and that's why he tells us if you know we will be forgiven as we forgive others because what did he say on the cross guys he said father forgive them for they know not what they do so then we have this Corruption, and I got this picture of it. I was just looking at the news, and I saw this, and I was just like, "That is just bizarre." I mean, it was really weird when Mount St. Helens erupted back in the eighties. Looked kind of weird, it looked like a man's head, like Abraham Lincoln or something. And um, but this, and this. I don't know. It speaks for itself. Take a good look at it. But we're going to dig deep today. And we're going to learn how, by God's word and what his message is, to trust in him. To lay down our anxieties, our cares, our, our worries, our insecurities. We're going to glorify the power that is in Christ. And please know that the Holy Spirit isn't going to be removed. God's elect are here up until the end. And don't forget, don't forget, God promises and says in his word that he will pour his spirit out upon all flesh all flesh before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So that just blows that right out of the water, you know. All I know is this, guys. God and Jesus, Yeshua the Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, speak the truth. And all men are liars, ourselves included. We've all... <sighs> Just if I could just sit back and re and reflect how many times I thought I had something so down pat and understood it and even thought I was doing right. And then comes that humility moment and you're like, oh, I didn't understand that. And I might have even like, got angry at somebody for their ignorance in the word of God or something and or 
not understanding Jesus Christ. You know? The Lord will show you so much <laughs> when you ask him and you're open to receiving that you take his heart and you find out how just really stony your heart is and it's, it's humbling because boy you know I've told you before uh, how I got caught into legalism and all that and I'll tell you what you will just chew up a little lamb like that you'll push people away you won't be bringing any into the flock I'll be running and injured. So anyway, we're going to get in here. Uh, I'm going to talk about Christ's limitless resources and how we can depend on him. Because I know there's much anxiety. There's much fear. There's moments when I'm like, wait a minute, you know, what's going on? And um, there's so much suffering and there's so much hurting in the world and it's going to get worse. And I'm not prepared I'm telling you, I'm not prepared to watch children suffer. I am not prepared. I don't, I, I, I don't even know how I'm going to cope with that. So I have to trust him. That if I'm here, he's going to give me the strength and the heart to do his will. Because it's getting so dark, guys. And it's getting so very... I mean, have you watched the news? <laughs> the children, the elderly, the least of these. The disabled, the suffering... are really going through it guys and the wickedness that is presenting itself in our faces you know God hears the cries he hears the cries he's going to answer And it's just getting ripe. I mean, something's coming and it's going to get so ripe for the world to want a savior. They're going to be desperate. <clears throat> and that's going to open that door for him, for the dark, evil entity of the second beast. Because he's going to come playing God. He's going to claim to be our creator. He's going to claim to know the mysteries of all the things people want to know the answers to. And it's going to be very deceptive and very oppressive. But it's going to look like, oh, utopia is here. I mean, it's going to be so... <clears throat> deceiving. I truly believe he's going to be playing Jesus Christ. That's what it says. He's going to come in like the lamb. He's going to act like he's risen people from the dead. He's going to be doing miracles. He's going to be bringing lightning down. Supernatural. It's going to be very dark. So we have to make sure that we are secured. We're on the ark. We're sealed up tight. We're keeping our eyes on Christ and we're trusting in him for all things. So with that said, we're going to go to Psalm 37. This is a very important psalm. And uh, it's actually the instruction to the present blessing that is promised to us in Psalm 23. You know, Psalm 23 is so powerful. It has all the sacred names of God in it. 
its miraculous power from on high, its promise, its rest. It's amazing. You know, I made a video about the Psalm 23 and the miraculous power and meaning of it. <clears throat> it's kind of buried in here somewhere, but uh, maybe I can repost it. But uh, we're going to cover that. And um, I'm going to read to you Psalm 23 just before we get started here and digging into Psalm 37. And I take you a couple places in Matthew and Luke. So with that said, let's go to Psalm 23. But before we go to Psalm 23, I wanted to bring to your attention, I don't know if you heard about it or not, but they are planning on opening the United States Embassy in Jerusalem in May of this year in time for the Israel's 70th anniversary. <clears throat> Pretty amazing, guys. I want you just to always keep in the back of your mind, too, that uh, the Locust Army that's mentioned in Revelation 9 that come up out of the pit and that's referred to in Joel chapter 1, the Locust Army, well, their life cycle is five months, five moons, so new moon to new moon months okay and time of that life cycle of the locus begins in may to september that five month period i find that very interesting so with that said knowing may is the time of pentecost when the holy spirit washed over the disciples when they were in the upper room 120 people started professing and speaking the tongue of the Holy Spirit where it was poured out that was at Pentecost which is in May so you know, guys, it's time to be alert. But that's their plans. They are, they have committed it. They're saying that the ribbon cutting could take place on May 14th of this year. There's a lot going on I'm talking about. Even Rush is talking about accepting Jerusalem being the capital to divide the land, which I think has already been done by the Vatican, by the way. But anyway, that's not here or there right now, but I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Things are really moving forward and um, there's some very, very strange anomalies. Weather guys, very strange. So it's time to really buckle up buckle up make sure we are safe secure on the ark you know the lord told me revealed to my spirit to shut the door and i did a study on here about that but it, you know it's time to seal up tight not to let the darkness in shut the door on the darkness guys it's time to really rend our hearts. Let him search our hearts. Let him do a work in us. As willing vessels. It's not going to always be easy or pretty. It might bring you to your knees, but hey, that's where we need to be. Humble servants. So with that said, let's go to Psalm 23 real quick. I hope that 
the magnificence, the beauty, and the truth, the powerful truth of Psalm 23 gets revealed here. I know it is a psalm that we usually hear people say on someone's deathbed or at a funeral. And you know, it's really sad that that's what it's usually used for. That it's not usually, it's used, not used for our day to day walk. And because it is truly a psalm for the living, it's not for a psalm for the dying. And this psalm is all about the Messiah, the great shepherd in resurrection, the fulfillment of what he's doing with his flock. And David wrote this a thousand years before Christ ever walked the earth. And it's just so amazing and powerful. It has all the sacred names of God in it. And a lot of times, you know, when we're reading it out of the regular King James or another version of the translation it really has lost so much we we just are missing the biggest points and so i'm going to read just read it the way we've always read it and then i'm going to go through it with you and show you all the sacred names of god that are in here and show you what he's really truly saying to us because this is for you and it's for me all right, Psalm 23, a Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, when I discovered this psalm in the Companion Condensed Bible, it was just so amazing to me because it just opened up the scriptures and the truest meaning. And um, it comes after Psalm 22, which was David prophesying of Christ on the cross. And even, even down to when he said it is finished and he gave up the ghost on the cross. Well, this psalm follows that, follows Psalm 22, because it's about his resurrection and his power and his place for his flock. That's you. That's me. So he says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. This is one of God's sacred titles. It's Jehovah Roi the great shepherd. And when he says, I shall not want, it's because God provides. He's Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah will provide. And it says, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. It actually means he causes me to lie down. He's continually giving us rest and feeding us. And he feeds us and he gives us rest. And we don't trample down the pastures because he's given us green pastures, choice pastures, the best pastures, the pastures of tender grass. And then it says, he leadeth me beside the still waters. Well, he causes us to rest that's our rest in him. He's leading his flock to rest. And the still waters, that's the waters of rest. That's Jehovah Shalom. The waters of peace, the living water. It says he restoreth my soul. 
means he brings our soul back from the times of despair, times where we just, our soul is so tired and we just cannot go on and there's no way we could go on in our own strength. And that's Jehovah Rapkika. He's the great physician. And he leadeth me in paths, righteous paths for his namesake. Well, that's paths of righteousness, righteous paths for his own namesake. And that's his name, Jehovah Zidkanu. Paths of righteous paths, paths of righteousness, the God of paths of righteousness. It's his righteousness. That's where we become righteous. That's the only place we can get our righteousness is from him. And he does it for whose sake? His own sake. His own name's sake. He says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Well, this is the valley of deep, dark shade. It doesn't necessarily mean death's dark valley. But when it says, I'm walk yea, though I walk through this valley of deep shade, it, it's not into, but through. He's telling you, you're coming out on the other side. He's already telling you this. And even if it is into death, we're coming out into the resurrected life, resurrection. But there's a resurrected life. He's brought us up out of the ashes now. Or we wouldn't even be here. We wouldn't even be in this. Our lives would be totally destroyed. We may not even be alive. If his hand was not on us. So he's telling us. Yea, though I walk through. The death's dark valley. Or the valley of deep shade. Either one, you're going through. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. That's Jehovah Shema. And then he says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Well, there's two things that a, she a shepherd carries. And his Sacred name is Jehovah Shema, thou art with me. And the shepherd carries the rod and the staff, the club and the crook. The first, that club, that's for defending the sheep. If a wolf or some kind of predator comes along, he'll club it. And the latter, he uses for help. The crook, to guide the sheep. club is for the sheep's enemy. The crook is for the sheep's defense. Don't want to beat the sheep. You guide them. Comfortly, gently lead. That's what it's saying. Thou art with me, Jehovah Shema. Thy club and thy crook, they gently lead me. Comfort. When you know he's leading you, you can be in comfort. And then he tells us, thou preparest or settest in order a table. Do you know what that table is? It's a feast. It's a feast. He's setting before you a feast in the presence of your adversaries, your enemies, your adversaries. It's not just physical, guys. This is more spiritual than anything. Because believe me, you have an enemy, someone don't like you, well, I can tell you. Beyond their flesh. Spiritual, we're in a spiritual war. So he's preparing, setting in order a feast before us in the presence of our adversaries, our enemies. That table it's a feast. He's already got everything set up for it, just as he did the Passover. Supper. He wants us to sup with him. 
He will knock. We open the door. He wants us to sup with him. And that's so we feast. We feast on him while he fights. That's Jehovah Nissi. While we're sitting down feeding at this table right now, at his table and partaking with him, he's fighting for us. I can't believe the first time that ever got revealed to me. And I didn't even know it was in this psalm. I didn't even know that's what that really meant. And he clearly told me in my spirit, you rest, feed on me, and I will fight. And I've never forgotten it. Sometimes I forget to apply it, and I have to remind myself. And that's why we're going through this right now. So, he's got you a feast already prepared. He's sitting before us at the presence, in the presence of our adversaries, our enemies. We're still sheep. He's, this is the table, the pasture. This is everything. Our enemies are our adversaries. The devil is our biggest adversary, and he has lots of minions. Listen, thou anointest my head with oil. Oh, that's Jehovah Mekadashkim. He's anointing us. The king is anointing us. He's anointing our heads. We're his. We are his. We're in his care. My cup runneth over. Well, the shepherd's cup, that's his living water. It runs over. It never, ever stops flowing. It's the shepherd's cup of water for the sheep runneth over. It's never going to stop flowing. When you sit at the king's table, he feeds you a feast that as long as you'd like to partake and eat, he will feed you. And he's going to keep filling your cup up with his living water. Because a good shepherd cares for the sheep. He promises us that. And he anoints us be his and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the after all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever he's telling us surely his goodness his grace his loving kindness will follow chase after us closely closely all the days of our lives even in the future, past, present, future. He's in tomorrow. He's already there. He's already took care of that problem for us. We just, it's our time to just trust him, to do what he asks us to do, to hear his voice, to hear his call, to sup with him, and he will lead us. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forevermore. That means eternally. It means no length of days. Ever. Eternally. It's quite amazing. Psalm 24 is awesome too. Psalm concerning David and the true David. Remember we talked about there were two Davids? Well, that's Psalm, Psalm 24 is about Messiah the chief shepherd in glory. It's beautiful too. But uh, it's a time for us to totally abide in this psalm. It's powerful. It's healing. It's comforting. It's not a psalm for the dead. It's a psalm for the living. Truly. These are the things that he wants to do for us. We're living in some very uncertain times. We're living in a time like no other. It's very dark. We are going to be walking through the valley of deep shade. We already are. It's getting darker and darker. And we have to have our shepherd. And we have to be resting in this. And we have to be feeding on his, what he gives us. We have to be 
supping with him, just as he sat down at the Last Supper with his disciples. He desires us to be at his table. He will do all the preparations. He will provide everything, just as he did with the disciples. He just told them where to go, to the upper room. Pretty amazing. Because you and I, every day, we have an endless, endless need list, okay? I mean, if we sat down and just, Lord, I need this, and Lord, I need that. And I'm not talking necessarily about, I'm not talking about money necessarily. I'm not even talking about, I'm just talking about things that we really need to make it, to get through the day, to get through the month, to be able to follow him and serve him and to touch others. I mean, we have an endless list of stuff. And he's the only one that has the limitless resources. We have to trust him. We have to trust him. Because I can tell you, every time I think I need to take control of something or do something in my own power, it blows up in my face. I get a total check in my spirit and I'm like what am I doing I know better than this I know this is something I need to trust him with especially when you start getting worried and anxious and you know we're in some times that uh, are like no other I mean the stock market just fell 666 points a couple weeks ago I mean clearly that's a freaky sign, all right? I'm sure it kind of freaked people out that don't even believe in the Bible. But, uh, you know, stock market, all that stuff, it's going to come to naught, guys. Uh, God said so. That's Tyre. That's Tyrus in the Bible. I've talked about it before. That's part of the kingdom of the beast. It's... Um, the riches, the trafficking, the merchandise, the monetary system, the whole nine yards. And, you know, we're going to have to make sure we trust him for our provisions, for everything, everything. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, he's already got it worked out. It's really about do we trust him? And Jesus talked about some of these things. He talked about it in Matthew 6, Luke, 20, uh, Luke 12, chapter 12. He talked about these things. He surely did. Let's go to Matthew 6 real quick. In Matthew chapter 6, this is to our walks every day. There's comfort in it and instruction. He's telling us how. To walk as a flock, as individual sheep, he's telling us. He says, take heed that you do not do your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Your alms are your charitable works. The things that you do in charity, it's not to be seen. You know, it's... Like you'll hear, well, so-and-so donated $10,000 to this organization or to, to our church or whatever, you know, um, or to the homeless or whatever. And we're really not supposed to do it that way. He says, uh, we're to do it in secret. All right. He says, Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you that they have their reward. Well, if they want the recognition of humanity, if that's what they're doing it for, that's their reward. It's not going to have anything accumulating for them with the Lord. Because they did it for their own name, their own recognition, their own pat on the back. That's how we can always test to see when we do something charitable. Are we doing it 
because we want our name associated with it to get favor? Or are we doing it because this is what the Lord directed us to do? It has nothing to do with our names. We can do it without anybody even knowing it's us. Okay. Um, and that's why he says, when you do your alms, this is your charity. Something you do in charity out of love. Charity is love. Okay. When you when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. He means you do, you don't even let your you don't even let your mind go that way. You you just you keep it separate. He says um that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily, I say unto you, they have their reward. Same kind of thing, you know, you always see it in Jerusalem. They're always at the wailing wall. They're putting their prayers in the wall in front of everybody. Um, some leader will go there and it'll be made a big fiasco out of it's. You know, he calls that as a hypocrite. So he says, um... This is the most important part, guys. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. This is when you go in to your secret place with him. This is when you go in to your prayer closet in your heart. It doesn't matter where you are. You can be in the middle of a grocery store. You can be middle of downtown rush hour traffic it doesn't matter you go into that secret chamber of your heart with him and you shut that door and all darkness all things of the world have to leave it's just you and him you're entering into the holy of holies he paid a very very steep price for us to do that that's when he rent the veil on the cross he rent, when he died and gave up the ghost the veil rented in the holy of holies can you imagine? Those priests probably about had to go change their underwear when they saw that happen. They probably really did. And he says, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen, heathen do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. That's chanting. That's making all that noise, carrying on, doing a ritual, making all kinds of noise, making a spectacle of yourself. You know, that's the one thing I think that is so amazing about our faith is that we don't even have to, no one even has to know we're talking to him. No one knows. I can be sitting here praying while I'm talking to you. No one knows. No one knows what our conversation is in our hearts with him. That's what he desires. That's a real relationship with him. The rest is all the flesh. Then the flesh is in it. And believe me. There's no reward of that. But he wants to commune with your heart, your spirit. He says, Be ye not therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. He is in the tomorrow. He's already there. He's already got it planned out, mapped out. He's got the table set. He knows what to feed you today. He knows what to feed you tomorrow. You don't even have, before you even ask, and then most time when we ask, we ask amiss, right? <laughs> After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this, our, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Wow, guys. Did you ever stop and think about that? Give us this day our daily bread. Hmm? That's our spiritual bread. That's our spiritual food. As well as physical. He's already got everything we need mapped out. He just asks us to forgive. <laughs> to forgive. So that we can be forgiven. We ask him for forgiveness, repentance, and we forgive those that have offended us. You can't carry that around. Wow. So, he says, 
then after that, he says in verse 14, he says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, hey, that's not just your brethren, guys. That's not just, you know, your sister or your brother in Christ. No, this is if you forgive men humanity their trespasses your heavenly father will also forgive you but if you forgive not men their trespasses neither will your father forgive your trespasses moreover when you fast be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast verily i say unto you they have their reward you know guys um he's asking us to take his heart and to leave the flesh out of it. Okay? We don't want to be a hypocrite. We want to be true to him in our hearts. So, he says, he's talking about fasting. And uh, this can be, this doesn't have necessarily have to be food. Okay? You can fast from the world. I do that a lot. Just fast from the world. Fast from things that, I mean, you'd be surprised how much more clearly you can hear his word and you can hear him when you don't have all that chatter of the world in there. And, you know, I'm sorry, but entertainment's getting, it's just downright evil. I mean, it's just, you can't even get away from the subliminal and the in your face stuff, both. It's more in your face than ever of the world, but it's also got a lot of subliminal stuff in it. He says, but thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head and wash thy face. That thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father, which is in secret. And thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Look, he knows your heart. He knows my heart. He knows when we're doing something out of flesh and when we're doing something out of the spirit of our heart for him. He says, this is most important, guys. Lay not up yourselves for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where the moth and the rust doth corrupt, and where the thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Guys, if we have any kind of security and trust in the tangible, then... It, 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 we are really trusting in our substance. We're not trusting in him. We have to trust in him. We thank him every day for her having roofs over our heads or whatever we have to eat or whatever. I mean, it, it's a blessing. There are many that are hurting in that way. And if he's given us that and it's come easy to us, then we surely should be doing something something to make sure that we're helping others in need. Okay? Um, I can tell you that this, they, these, these things that are our physical attachments, and we really would be surprised probably how attached to stuff we really are. But I can tell you that there's a great shaking coming. And all of this materialism, the financial, the materialistic, the wooden stone, that is all Tyre. That is the, the king of Tyre is Satan. And that's the little rock. It's the fake rock. Why is that the fake rock? Because that's the easiest thing to make, can make, that you can make your God or take place of God in your life. It's the easy, it's the, it's the most common thing because then it, the money and the substance and the materialistic things become our gods. And those things are going to go to nothing. So he tells us to lay up treasures. Our treasures are what is our charity. The things that we do out of the love and our hearts for others. We, we have nothing to gain from. And it is clearly clearly done in the spirit by the love of the heart of the father through the holy spirit he has given you the direction and the unction to do something and believe me 
It's never going to benefit you. It may not even make sense what he's asking you to do. Because it more than likely will be something that will never, ever be able to sew back into your life at all. Maybe someone you've only seen one time, never even knew their name. It's the truth. And he says right here, this is, this is the heart of it all right here, exactly the heart of it all. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore the eye be, thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. So what is he telling us? The light of the body is the eye. And if thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. This is being in one with him, his heart, his spirit, the simplicity that is Christ of taking on, he, look, just taking part of him, giving our hearts, rending our hearts to him and taking his heart and letting him take those hearts of stone. And I can tell you what, if we have any unforgiveness, if we have anything that we have held against another, and we've not handled that over to him. Mm. Then we're getting, we've got hardness in our hearts. And that is the darkness that will be in our eye. Because it's not an obedience. This whole chapter just flows together. He's weaving it all together for us to see it. So that, the light of the body is the eye. And the body it's not just your body. It's the, his body, the body of Christ. This is what he expects. We are one. We are all to be doing what he's commanded us to do as his sheep, as his flock. So, you know, it's that. It's what's in our hearts. It will create darkness. That's why unforgiveness it's like drinking toxin, toxic poison. It's like injecting yourself with cancer, a blackness, a death. It'll kill it every time. And then he goes on and says in verse 24, no man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Guys, mammon is money. It's materialistic things. And that's why he's going to be so hard on those shepherds that are trafficking the sheep. Because they should have known better. They know this. I mean, this is Matthew 6. It's got the Lord's Prayer in there. Come on. <laughs> you know, everybody knows this chapter. He says, Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Hey, you got anxieties? You got worries? Take no thought for your life, for what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Have you ever seen a, a sparrow or a robin or, or some kind of bird out there having an anxiety attack because it can't find a worm? I mean, come on, guys. That's the one thing I love about God's nature. It knows its purpose. It follows its purpose. And it's provided for. Isn't that amazing? That's just amazing to me. Hmm. He says, which of, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto your stature? Like all your worries, every time you worry, you worry, worry, worry. You know, that's what somebody said to me one time. You worry, worry, worry. You know, I used to be a worry word. I am the kind of person that I had a very proactive mindset. It kind of gets boiled into you as a medical professional. 
In the medical professional, you have to be proactive. You know that if this could lead to this, so you must intervene and take care of this because if not, this is going to happen. Kind of like if you know someone has high sugar levels as a diabetic and they will not get them under control and they're already got an infection in their foot, then you know because you've seen it before, that their foot will get gangrene. I have had patients' feet come off in my hands. <laughs> I mean, you know these things. So this is just the way we are. We're just trained to be proactive, although the majority of the world isn't. But, um, like, common sense is left. But that's my, been my mindset. So, of course, that's how I've operated all my life is by using this process and it, it you know you can know too much in the flash right you can truly know too much and you can become your own worst enemy because then you're always thinking proactively and this leads to anxiety everybody and this leads to worry and this leads to uh concern and you're up at night because you can't figure out how you're going to pay that bill or you can't figure out how this is going to work out or how that's going to work out and then you start to imagine all these things and you know what by the you'll be sick you'll have insomnia you'll be cranky you're going to get depressed your health will suffer your mindset will suffer you will not enjoy anything you will find no joy in anything i'm telling you lived it done it had to turn it over, had to surrender it, because that is how I was. And when I started my walk with my true walk with God, this was what just so gave me so much comfort. I can tell you, my world can be falling apart. I go to sleep at night, okay? I can have the worst news. I go to sleep at night. I know he's on the throne. I know he's taking care of it. I know my times are, your times are all in his hands. I know that if it weren't for him, it would have all fallen apart a long time ago. Things should have been a thousand times worse than they even are at the moment that I'm sitting here. I've learned to trust him. But I am not an easy person to break. I know that. I have been stubborn all my life. And I finally had to realize that my stubbornness has to be used for his kingdom. I need to reverse that mindset. I need to trust him. Because all that worry in the world isn't going to change anything. You know, I was in my 20s and this was kind of like the beginning of it. I mean, God had been working on me for a long time, guys. And I, I'm telling you, uh, it took him a lot to get to get me to sit down and sup with him. It really did. Because, I mean, I went every direction. I was raised in the church and everything and I was raised very strict, uh, legalistic, uh, teaching, you're going to burn, you're going to burn, you're going to burn. And, you know, I'm like, hey, I, I've messed up so bad now. By the time I was 18, I was like, I have messed up so bad now that there's just no sense in me even going to church. I would be a hypocrite and I'm just going to burn anyway. I, I've already got the death sentence. That's the way I felt. So I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to walk away and, you know, kind of like, uh, I'll leave you alone, God, if you leave me alone, kind of thing. How, how stupid, right? But he didn't. He never left me alone. And I can just look back and remember the times he would be speaking to me and showing me something right in my face. And one day I was driving to work. I was in my 20s. And um, there's a sign on this church billboard. And it says, worry and anxiety is like paying interest on a loan you haven't even took out yet. And I'm like, that's really true. It struck a chord with me. It really did. Now, did it sink in? Nope, nope, not for a long, long time later, but I always remembered seeing that sign and it made sense to me because it's true. Why would you go to the bank, apply for a loan, but you don't even know if you got the loan. You haven't even took the loan. It could even be approved, but you never, like, took the loan, right? 
Why would you already pay interest on a loan you didn't even take out? Or maybe it's a loan you were talking, thinking about taking out years later. You ain't going to pay interest on a loan you haven't even took out. This is exactly what we're doing. And Jesus is saying, by any of you worrying and having anxiety, is are you going to grow even an inch from that worry? No, it's not. It's going to take its toll on you. And he says, why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. No, oh, they're not making their own, um, you know, raiment, petals. They're not making their own stems. They're not doing any of that. He says, and yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O you little faith? He's talking about a beautiful lily, a beautiful, the one of the most beautiful flowers you could ever just imagine. And he's like, Look at the beauty of that. And you think God's going to create beauty that's going to, that ends up, you know, it could get in the hot heat and just fall. Okay. God doesn't want you to be a hothouse lily where you just get into some heat and you're just like crumbling. No, no, because he gives you his strength. So he's telling you, uh, shall he not much more clothe you? Oh, ye of little faith. Oh, ye of little faith. How many times Jesus said that? Oh, ye of little faith. You know? He says, therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or with, wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek. Yeah, the pagans. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Gee, it's pretty easy. We put on Christ, and he does the work. Our flesh and the things we do on our own are not righteous. He is our righteousness. It's him, us supping with him, inviting him in. He takes over. You know how Satan's possessing all these people, guys? You know he's getting all these people to do all these things? Well, it's the complete opposite. You're going to give yourself over to Christ. He is going to take control of the reins of the heart. Our minds. He's, we're taking on his mind. I mean, you know, it's one way or the other. You know, either you're going to be in him, walking with him, partaking with him, supping with him, being one with him, inviting his spirit and his heart into ours. Or it's that other guy who's going to control your flesh, send demons your way. Hey, you know what? Humanity is so deprived today. Uh, I don't even, I mean... It's pretty wicked. People that are not even acting demonically possessed are acting pretty wicked. I mean, it is like the days of Noah, right? It really is. It's pretty crazy. I mean, Jesus is like your inoculation against the darkness. And how hurtful, hurtful it would be for us when we're in darkness. How, have you ever hurt someone's feeling? Have you ever snapped at someone and hated yourself for it? I mean, can you just imagine if you're overtaken by darkness, how horrible and self-loathing you are going to feel? I don't know, guys. I mean, this is the way to go. This is really the way to go. He says, so take no thought, therefore no thought for the tomorrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. You know what he's saying here? You take one day at a time, one step at a time, one moment at a time. How, you know what? If you can't even handle knowing what's coming the next minute, you just take one moment with him. One moment, one step, one baby step. Trust him. He's got this. He's got us. 
You know, a lot of times we worry about things and you know what? They either don't come to fruition. That was our imagination. Or, you know what? Never even turned out. Nothing, nothing close to what we sat there and worried about. But then something else came out of the right hand side and blindsided us. We didn't even see that coming, right? That's usually how it is, right? You worry, worry, worry about, or you're concerned about this happening, that happening, and it's never that thing. It's always something you did not see coming. You know? Never saw my mom passing away. Didn't see my mom coming down with some terminal illness. Nope. It was always my dad on the deathbed. From the time he was in his early 50s. My dad is 80. He'll be 88 years old in May. My mom's been gone almost 10 years now. I would have never thought that. You see what I'm saying? We think we, we're like, oh, and you know what? And the very, you know, another thing like that happened to me. You know, I had um, two stepsons along with my son. And my son and the youngest stepson, they were, um, they tried, I mean, they made my hair fall out <laughs> when they were teenagers. I'm telling you, I mean, they were constantly, I'm just like, and then there was the older one and he was really quiet and introverted and, um, real reserved. And, you know, of course, uh, you know, you worry about teenagers anyway. They concern you because <laughs> they're kind of crazy. They're pretty crazy. They're, you know, uh, raising teenage boys, I, I, I came to realize that uh, teenagers are like temporary little sociopaths. And uh, they've lost their minds. And, and all you can do is just hope to God that they uh, come back to their senses. You know, it's like the hormones are just making them crazy. But um, the two younger ones. Um, my son and my youngest stepson, uh, they would do things that I'm just like, oh my gosh, you know, they're just, something bad's going to happen. They're going to, they're going to end up getting killed. And, you know, I take the car away. I catch them doing stupid stuff. Um, you know, I'm just like, oh, you know, I'll tell you, if you haven't lived through, uh, teenagers driving, um, that that will test your faith right there and um but i never worried about the older one he drove like a grandma uh, <laughs> i mean i can remember riding with him and i'd be like oh i'll be like ryan the gas pedal is on the right buddy can you press it you know and i never worried about him in that way and um but you know my son and my youngest stepson, they are alive. They made it. The oldest one, he didn't. He died in a car accident. Freak accident. Nothing that he did, you know. But he's the one that lost his life. And it just goes to show, you know, I, I can't, my hair fell out, guys. I worried about these two boys. They were doing dumb stuff. And uh, you got to get up pretty early in the morning to get anything past me anyway. And, um, <laughs> you know, so I'm always catching what they were doing. I always knew what they were going to do and say before they even did it. You know, they swore that I was tapping their bug in their rooms and all kinds of things. But I just knew, you know, mother knows. I just knew. So it just goes to show you guys the things you worry about, the the very things that you think are sure it's going to be that person and that person's going to do that and this is going to happen. And, you know, I've um, been through that a lot with my son. Been through a lot of that with my son. And the devil likes to use that to torment us. He truly does. And it takes then it takes our focus off of what we should be praying for or what we should be looking at. And we, then we'll miss what we should be seeing and focusing on. You know, I'm just saying. So with that said, I know we've been here a little while. So I want to read Psalm 37 to you because I'm telling you the truth. When Christ's limitless resources 
they will meet our endless needs. He will provide. He's got it all in the bag for us. So let's go to Psalm 37 and wrap this up. You know, there's a true David and there's a flesh David. And he was at war with himself a lot. And if we're honest, we can relate to that, right? It's like we have that good angel, that bad angel. And we war with ourselves sometimes. And sometimes we've confused the two. But in Psalm 37, this is David. You know, he had a lot of inner battles with himself even. So instead of looking at this, just as when God's talking in this psalm against the wicked and the lawless, just think about an internal conflict. Because that flesh, in that flesh, in our flesh bodies, the reason it's not going in to, to inherit the kingdom of God is because there is no good thing in it. Nothing. And it gets us in trouble. Okay? So, it's defiled. It has something. I mean, there was a fall in the garden and the flesh is just, it's going to death. It's dying. And now, we're to take on the new man. The new, by the spirit of Christ. So we, we're going to overcome lawlessness and unrighteousness and all those things that we are in the flesh. It's a process. David went through that process. David was a murderer. David was an adulterer. He committed murder to cover up the adultery. Um... You know, a lot of people don't want to talk about that stuff, but it's the truth. You know, and David is going to sit with Christ. It's amazing. So, thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy on us. But I'm going to read you Psalm 37. Heat not thyself with vexation because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. You know, he's talking about anger. Fret not. Heat not. You know when you're angry, you feel that heat. I mean, your face will get red. Uh, your blood pressure goes up. I mean, that is when we can open, we're opening the door to getting in trouble. When we've lost control, we've gotten angry. That's our flesh rising up, okay? So he's telling us, heat not thyself with vexation. All right. Because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Confide in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. This has everything to do with what we were reading in Psalm 23. All right. This is the instructions to the present blessing of what is promised to us in Psalm 23. That's why I'm going here. Confide in the Lord and do good, so thou shalt dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself in the Lord also, and he shall give thee the desires of the heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Confide also in him, and he shall bring it to pass, and he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy complete vindications as the noonday. Did you pick up on that? He said he shall give you the desires of your heart. You know, he's going to give you the desires of your heart when you've taken his heart. When you are in union with him and his heart. Because then your desires will be his desires. Mm, something to think about. He's burning away that dross. That dross is exactly the enemy. It is the enemy of all good. This carnal mind, this carn carnality, the flesh, you want to call it? I don't care what you want to call it, but it's carnal mind. Carnality about us. It's an enmity with God and the spirit. All right. They're at war with one another. There is a war going on. Christ is coming to burn off all the impurities. We are walking in the new man. The old man is dying dead. Okay. 
Commit thy way unto the Lord. Confide also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light. He shall bring forth righteousness in us as the light. And thy complete vindications as the noonday. Stand still in the Lord and wait patiently for him. You ever felt that? You ever felt that instruction? You ever felt him say, Be still and know that I am God? Oh, do you know that's when he moves the most? When we stop, when we stop, when we stop trying to, t to take things in control. When we stop trying to take it in our own hands and forcing this and forcing that. Oh, you know, that is a heavy burden to live with, guys. That is going to drive you crazy. If you think you have to do this and do that and manipulate and make this happen, make that happen. You're just putting yourself in a pretzel. You're weaving yourself up into a spider web that you will never get out of. It's it, it's bad. Okay. Stand still in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Heat not thyself with vexation. Oh, he's repeating it again. Because of him who prospereth in his way. Because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Don't get yourself all mad about that. Don't find yourself, you know, people call this right, you know, righteous indignation and all that stuff. You know, you know what, guys? <laughs> I have learned when I see something like that that just really you know is offensive to God you know what instead of getting mad like I used to I start to pray for that person now and I'm like therefore the grace of God go I Lord um, I mean it's just I'll tell you it is not good when we lose our composure. It is not good when we lose our temper because then we are making, yielding way for the devil to come in. And I can tell you, I've really been tried in this area. Really, truly have. And um, it's uh, easier said than done. I can tell you that but by the power. But God. But God. And... Um, I can just tell you that uh, we it, we tend to take things personally a lot of times, and uh, God's letting the, this person still exist and giving them the mercy and time to repent. And um, I can just tell you that I just want you to imagine it being your child. Just imagine it being your child standing there saying the utmost worst hurtful things to you. Um, yeah, that's a tormented person there. Uh, that truly is. You know, when someone else is lashing out and they're saying really hurtful things and they're doing hurtful things to you, that, that, that person, you know, should be pitied. They really should because they're not... They're, they're in their own prison. And, you know, some people get really angry when they see someone evil prospering. I mean, now that we might see uh, in, the, in the elite a lot. And people get mad about that and everything. But you want to know, if you know God's plan, you know that that actual thing that that's, they're prospering in, it's going to be their downfall. You've seen a lot of people falling lately. You know? The Lord is cleaning house, guys. So there's no sense in getting mad about that, okay? Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Heat not thyself with vexation in any wise to do evil. He's saying it a third time. When you hear something repeated three times especially in the Word of God, you better really, really cl pay close attention. For evildoers shall die, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the land. They're going to be cut off. You know, the, some really wicked men cut off 
our Messiah, our Lord, Emmanuel, God with us. They cut him off in the flesh. But he defeated death. And then he opened salvation to all. And the world became under his grace and his mercy and his long suffering. And to have his heart is to understand that plan. It truly is. It changes everything. It changes everything. You will find that it takes a lot, a lot to offend you. You won't be offended at the slightest things. You won't take everything personally. It does change the way you perceive things. It really does. For yet a little while, and the lawless shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth. The meek. The patient, oppressed people. That's in Matthew 5.5. 5. Patient, oppressed. You know, I didn't have patience. I had none when I was young. Uh, none at all. It was one of my hardest lessons. And I am sure that is why my our Father in Heaven gave me my son for the person that he gave me. It's really taught me a lot of patience. I had none, guys. I really didn't. I had the patience of not Job. <laughs> and I am not where I want to be. I'm, I've come a long, long way. You know, they, they say the patience of Job for a reason. You know, and Job, you know, we've been, I've been putting Pastor Farag's uh, Job study up there. As a matter of fact, there's a new one out. Um, I haven't even got to watch it yet, but I'm going to post it. So I love the book of Job. Once I got a hold of that and I really, really absorbed that, um, yeah, my patience got tried. I don't know. You know, the, the Lord really worked on me with that. That was something he really had to work on me with. And I know it's for my good. And um, so when you're oppressed, have patience, guys. The Lord's going to deliver you. He will reward you openly. There's coming a day. It's coming so soon. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Peace. The lawless plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his judgment will come. The lawless have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down a poor and needy one and to slay such as be an up right in heart. Their sword shall enter into their own heart and their bows shall be broken. Guys, you know, I, I really believe this is starting to happen. Their swords are entering into their own hearts. Truly. Truly. And their bows shall be broken. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of the many lawless. But the arms of the lawless shall be broken. But the Lord upholdeth the righteous. The Lord regardeth with favor the days of the upright. And the inheritance, their inheritance, shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time. And in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. Ooh, that's for today, guys. That is for today. But the lawless shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke, and they shall consume away. Remember what we read, what I read to you out of uh, the book of Enoch, about the demons that come from the giants, the souls of the giants, from the union of fallen angels and women of men. Remember that. It's those souls, those demons, those are the demons. Those are the things that plague the flesh. They truly do. And you don't have to be possessed to be affected by them. Nope. They can oppress you. Have you ever had depression? Hmm. That was one of them. Yeah. Yep. 
You would be surprised how they've operated in your flesh. Mm -hmm. It's the truth. The Lord's winning this battle, though. Got to tell you. Yep. Yep. That's why we go through a refinement process. That's why he, uh, he basically kills off the old person that you were. You can have a funeral for it. You know what I'm saying? It's like it's gone. It's leaving. You know you're becoming a new creature in Christ. It's a, it's a rebirth. You're becoming the, new, the real you, the true you, not the dark you. The best, the best is coming out of you through Christ. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, they're going to be ashamed. They're going to be the ones ashamed. You know, they love to shame you. They're like bullies, you know. Taking, picking on the little kid in the in the in the schoolyard, you know. Bullies don't ever pick on, you know, the big fit, uh, popular people. Okay, the bullies pick on those that no one that aren't going to stand up for themselves. That, that no one's going to defend them. They're the you know the underdog. They're the little one. You know, bullies love to know who to pick on to get the most kick out of it, you know, because they're actually seeking power. That's power to them. You know, we have an enemy. It's a bully. It's a bully. And it'll even bully us in the flesh. In the flesh will bully us. <laughs> but you know what? We got something stronger in us through Christ than that. Mm, it's amazing. Well, that's what's going to perish, I can tell you that. And those demons, those things that have plagued humanity, well, they're going to go away in smoke. The lawless borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous is gracious and giveth. For his blessed ones shall inherit the land, and they that be cursed by him shall die. Hmm. You want to be blessed, you don't want to be cursed. The steps of a good man are prepared by the Lord, and he delighted in his ways. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. Did you catch that, guys? Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Yeah, we've all stumbled, guys. We've all fell short. I have been young, and now I'm old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. He is all day long gracious, and lead, lendeth, and his seed is blessed. Depart from evil, and do good, and thou shalt dwell forevermore. For the Lord loveth judgment, and forsaketh not his favored ones. They are preserved forever. But the seed of the lawless shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. The mouth of a righteous one speaketh wisdom, and his tongue talketh of justice. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. The lawless watcheth a righteous one and seeketh to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand nor condemn him when he is judged. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the lawless die, thou shalt see it. It's just like those giants that were in the promised land. God's, you know, God gave them the power to slay them. Christ is our giant slayer, okay? I've seen a lawless one ruthless and spreading himself like cedars in Lebanon. Hey, this is talking about the devil, all right? Yet he passed away and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. I'm telling you, he's going in the pit. He is going in the pit of the lake of fire, and we will never, ever see him again. All the damage he's done, all the hurt. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord, that we're serving an awesome, loving, gracious God. I'm telling you, you're going to be surprised when you see the end of the story when we get there. You're going to be surprised. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright. For the future of that man is well-being, but the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The end of the lawless shall be death. Yeah, the tares are going to be bundled up and burned. The salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. 
He is their strength in the time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. Did you get that? And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall have made them escape from the lawless and save them because they fled for refuge to him. So you see how we get delivered. You see how we get in a way of an escape because we flee for refuge to him. We run to the safety of his protective loving arms in the safety in the shade of his protective wings pretty amazing pretty amazing i just wanted to read that to you i'm telling you he is uh definitely definitely on the throne guys and he is doing a process in us and yeah i don't care how wicked you are i don't care how far gone you think you've been well, if you're sitting here listening to this old woman, I can tell you, God's got a plan for you. He is not going to give up on you. You're his. You're his creation. He is calling many, many people. Are you going to answer the door? It's up to us to open the door. We have to invite him in. That's one thing about Jesus. He will not force himself on you. He won't. He'll, he'll be persistent. He'll keep knocking. He'll keep knocking. He'll be like, hello, I'm here. You know? Uh, he'll tug at your heart. Well, guys, you know, I was going to talk to you about something else, but I just want you to be aware of something. Um, there is a lot of prophecy coming to pass, especially in the Middle East, of course. And um, there is an evil rising up there. It's some pretty wicked stuff. And um, it has everything to do with our White House. It has everything to do with politics. It has everything to do with entertainment. And um, it's very mystic. It's uh, totally evil. It's in the name of God. It is uh, very prevalent very prevalent more than you would know uh, I just want you to be aware I will talk more about it later but I just want you to know that um, there's a great deception in it it's tried to get people to believe that one side is against the other when they're all conjoined together okay and I'm talking political and um, there's gonna be a lot of shaking up going on and um, I just, with this news about what's going to be going on uh, in Jerusalem and what I'm seeing on the forefront in the news with the Middle East, Syria, um, guys, uh, we're getting very, very close. We're getting very, very close. And um, I just want you to realize that it's like a spell they've cast. It's bewitching. It has entrapped many a Christians, and it's aimed towards entrapping the Christians or anyone who has any belief or faith in God. Um, it is, it's very close. It's very, very close. It is in the White House. It is honored there. Uh, just be careful. Do not be fooled. And um, it's time to really step back. If you are still really taking sides politically, getting all caught up in that, I'm telling you guys, it is, it's bad. All right, it's really bad. I will go into it later. Um, it is mystical. Let's put it that way. It's pure black magic it's smoke and mirrors it is the forerunner of the appearance of the second beast I can tell you that it's leading up to that it's in the geographical location that was prophesied it would be in and um, look you don't um, 
I just feel that you guys should be aware of this. It has everything to do with Kabbalah, mysticism. Um, nothing is as it seems, everybody. Okay? It's almost like a magic trick. All right? It's very bewitching. And a lot of you know what I'm talking about in certain aspect because those of you you've been or listening and studying with us for a while know that in this election last year or in 2016 in the election uh, the Lord just really put a strong check in my spirit and he said back away back away this is bewitch this is bewitching step away and I started doing some digging and you know it's there it's there but some things have come to my uh, attention about certain things mystics mystic rabbis in certain locations that is prophesied that it would happen and um, I'm working on some of that now so that I can bring you the scriptures it's in the book of Zechariah so many of the prophecies are being fulfilled right now especially when it comes to Damascus um, Syria and now that we know that uh, this embassy is going to be erected and pr pretty much opened in two months. I mean, come on, guys. They're really building Jerusalem up really, really quick. The construction going on there is unbelievable. Oh, and by the way, I was listening to President Abbas speak at the United Nations. And he made a very strange comment that I could not believe I heard. Very interesting. Because it ties into Zechariah with this mystics and all this other stuff and all the prophecies of Jerusalem, Palestine, Gaza, Syria, um, all of it. <laughs> but he was, he made a comment, guys, that, you know, of course, they're very upset about the United States recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of the land of Israel and you know they don't want the, the Israelites in there at all okay the Israelis I'm sorry they don't want the Israel Israelis in there at all at all right but he said that their heritage the Palestinians genetic line is that of the Canaanites, which were the inhabitants in the promised land that God told the, the Israelites and Joshua to slay all the giants and slay everyone in that land because they had mixed with the fallen angels, guys. Even the animals were defiled. Remember? And they sent the spies in and they didn't go in. They were disobedient because the spies were like, oh, there's giants, you know. And God said, I'm slaying the giants. Go on in. So I found that to be very interesting because that is not what I have ever heard them claim to be. And they are not, the Palestinians are not Esau. Okay, and I've heard that Esau is Russia. <laughs> Esau is the brother of Jacob. <laughs> the Palestinians are not Esau. Okay, guys? No, that's not who they are. But what's very interesting is that he said that. And um, I've never, ever heard them ever say they were the Canaanites. And uh, the Canaanites, guys, were mixed <laughs> they were all their genetic line was all mixed up from the fallen angels okay so they're trying to say that that's originally their land before God even 
gave the Israelites the promised land. And in essence, if they're saying they're the Canaanites, which was of Noah through his son having an incestuous relationship with his mother, that's who the descendants of Canaan are. Um, and they were they were defiled with the with the fallen angels. Pretty interesting. I know that they are tied to the Ishmaelites, which is who I always believed they were, but. Uh, Never heard of them saying that they were quite tracing their roots back to the Canaanites. Pretty interesting. All righty. Well, guys, I love each and every one of you, and God bless you, and thank you so much for being here. And sharing this time with with all of us together and uh, I know we're a small group but you know uh, I'm thankful for each and every one of you well love and blessings to you uh, I am gonna come back soon and discuss more about this these mystic rabbis and what they're doing and how that relates to prophecy because boy is it right on time we're getting really close, guys. We're getting very, very, very close. Do not take one day with, for granted. Don't take anything for granted. Okay? Um, I don't know if you've heard or not either, but uh, I guess Yellowstone is really uh, showing some signs of instability. So... We need, we got to pray, guys. We got to cover the children. The children are not safe. The children and the, the ones that are not able to defend themselves are not safe, guys. And believe me, the powers that be and society ain't going to fix anything. It's up to us and our prayers and our covering and pleading the blood over the children over the innocent pray for those that are in darkness I don't care if they're your worst enemy pray for them I don't care what they've done to your family or to you pray for them you'd be surprised the difference it would make well I love you all God bless you and God we look to you tonight Above the singing, God, above the music, above the songs, let your name be lifted high, Jesus. Let your name be honored, God. And we commit all that we are to you, God, and everything that we do. And we reach towards you, Jesus. Surrender.